Ladies and gentlemen, please rise to welcome our guest of honor, President of the European Parliament, Mrs. Roberta Mezzola. Please remain standing as the Natalie Choir will now perform the Ode to Joy. Thank you very much. And now, please be seated. Uh, and now I would like to invite our host, Vice Rector of the College of Europe, Mrs. Eva Osniecka Tametska, to take the floor. Madam Vice Rector. Thank you. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Dear President Metzola, dear Rector Mogherini, the ambassadors, members of the parliament, esteemed guests, dear students, and dear colleagues. It is a proud moment for the College of Europe in Natolin to receive Madame President Roberta Metzola. Continuing a tradition of welcoming presidents of the European Parliament. In 2003, we received President Cox in 2004. President Borrell, in 2008 President Pettering, and in 2011 President Buzek. In the person of the President of the European Parliament, we received the European nations in their diversity, and the European people in their richness. President Metzola's interest in dialogue is deeply rooted in her background, and her achievements are the best proof of this fact. I do believe that dialogue is not a tool. Dialogue is an aim for which strength, unity, and prosperity are achievable. However, dialogue cannot happen between the alike. There would be nothing to exchange. Dialogue needs differences. The truth is the power of the European Union dwells in diversity of perceptions and views. 
the distinctive elements of the mosaic that together form the whole picture. At the College of Europe in Natalin and in Bruges, we also value our distinctive yet complementary qualities. If the College of Europe stands out in the academic world, it does not stand out despite its diversity. It stands out thanks to its diversity. With this diversity at the college, we were able to achieve a lot. The Natural Info Capacity Building Program for the candidate countries, the European Diplomatic Academy, and the new academic program that will start in Tirana soon. Ladies and gentlemen, on this note, I would like to express my sincere gratitude to Madam President Metzola to accepting our invitation to come to Natalin to give the keynote address to the Madeleine Albright promotion. Now I will give the floor to Rector Mogherini, who was so kind, to come to join us on this important occasion. Dear Federica, the floor is yours. Thank you, Eva. Dear Roberta, cara Roberta, Madam President, uh, um, I know very well that uh, you had a very long day in a very uh, complex week, uh, and uh, the audience here, our students, but also our guests, are not here to listen to me, but to listen to you. So I will only say thank you, grazie, because uh, uh, you're honoring us uh, um, twice. Twice because uh, you visit today uh, our campus in Natalin, and we're very proud of that, to receive you here in a campus that you had never visited before and that I think you have been looking forward to visit, a beautiful campus. It's just a pity that you cannot admire it in its beauty today because it's dark, so it means that you will have to come back. Exactly. <laughs> you got it. You got it. <laughs> Uh, but also uh, because we, you honoured us uh, with your presence at the opening of the previous promotion, uh, the Sassoli promotion last year, and you honour us not only as a president of the parliament, but you honour us as an alumna of the college. Uh, so it's uh, twice a double honour that you're making us uh, today. We're very grateful for that in a special year because uh, the year of the European elections uh, is a year where not only the institution that you represent and the citizens that you represent uh, are coming to a very important moment, but also I hope that the entire college community, our students, our graduates, our alumni, our professors, our faculty, our staff, will play, uh, I'm sure, uh, a very important role in multiplying the message of the importance of participating to the vote for the European Parliament. So thank you. I don't count anymore how many times I should thank you, you now for this. We are really very grateful to have you here. And uh, you're uh, always welcome in your uh, College of Europe in Bruges, in Natalin, one day in Tirana. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Madam Vice Rector, Madam Rector. It is now my pleasure to ask President of the European Parliament, Mrs. Roberta Mezzola, to deliver the keynote address of the Madeleine Albright Promotion 2023-2024 at the College of Europe in Natalin. Madam President. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Eva. Grazie. Federica, uh, dear Rector of the College, dear Vice Rector, dear students, dear Europeans, uh, ladies and the gentlemen, uh, let me start by thanking you. You don't, you know, thank me. I thank you, first of all, for inviting me here uh, to address you here today and particularly for giving me the opportunity and privilege of giving the keynote address of this uh, uh, academic year. Madeleine Albright uh, is a hero of mine, a woman who survived, who believed, who fought. And you and we have a lot to live up to. Now, as my alma mater, the College of Europe will always hold a very special place in my heart. The memories and connections that I made at the College of Europe in Bruges, as was the case for me, have been and still are a pivotal part of both my political and personal life. And I'm sure that I will say that I hope the same will be for you. I will deviate first because um, I have a 
formal speech, but I'm going to say one thing. You know, as an anecdote, I was in the College of Europe exactly 20 years ago, uh, so 2003, 2004. John Locke promotion, or as we called ourselves, the John Lockers. Uh, a very proud promotion, an extremely important one. It was the year that uh, people coming from my country uh, and the nine others, including this one, were joining the European Union. And I remember uh, thinking to myself, uh, with most of my friends actually who were from those countries, us telling each other, where will we be once our countries join the European Union? And what will this college look like when that happens? And we would talk about this with uh, fellow students who would tell us, we don't remember our country being outside the European Union. Since we were born, our country has been a member of the European Union. Today, 20 years later, I think you find yourself in that position. And I'm here maybe to rekindle a little bit of that hope and dream that we had. We had already done Erasmus, you know, the College of Europe was that thing that you had to do in order to be the best European student of European law and politics, economics, what we were doing. I left in the middle of my year, in 2004, uh, to run for the European elections. My parents were very worried then, you know, that I've told the Bruges campus this, that they thought, you know, I would not finish the year after I had invested so much in it. But for me, the choice was obvious, that uh, I would take a, a time off from my studies and go and campaign for what was then the very first European Parliament elections in those 10 countries. And it was a most amazing experience. Uh, I did not get elected, which means I could go back to the college and finish my studies, then my parents were very relieved. But it also taught me, uh, and as we now prepare and we are receiving emails for the 20th anniversary of our promotion, we have it sometime in the middle of June, just a week after the European elections, that when I go back and see those same friends and we have been to each other's weddings and we have you know, celebrated the birth of, 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 of kids, some of our friends got married to each other. Uh, I think that's still a thing, right, here, that, uh, so that we find your husband. I don't know, I found my husband before, so I, 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 although I found him through student politics and from Finland. But it was very much you know, an experience that you carry with you. And when I planned this trip, and, and we, we've been you know, trying to find the ideal date when I could go to Warsaw, and then I go to Gdansk, so I go in like one hour or so to Gdansk tonight, and uh, uh, on my, let's say, whistle-stop tour that we are organizing in each uh, member state, uh, and we combine meetings with the authorities, speeches before parliaments, uh, youth events, uh, and, of course, uh, um, uh, an appeal for everybody to not let this great occasion uh, of the European elections pass us by. Uh, when I saw Poland, I said, all right, it's not happening unless I'm going to Natolin. And this is really um, something that I'm, I'm proud to, to be able to finally be here. Uh, my friends who had come from Bruges to Natolin for the traditional trip still talk about it today. I have no idea what they did here. I'm not sure they studied too much, but uh, I regret not having come with them. So I'm really happy that I can close the circle tonight. Okay, I took a huge um, uh, diversion away, but I wanted to say this. So as I speak to you students today in 2024, we're a few months uh, away from the next European elections. And you know those, that responsibility that we had, and I hope you have, to, is to carry forward a belief in Europe and politics as a force for good. Because we are living in, in troubled times. Our hard-won democratic principles are being threatened. Uh, war has returned to our continent, while there are those that question the European Union's very existence. But to me, it's very clear, Europe's purpose is unchanged. From the ashes uh, of war and lessons learned from atrocities, which Poland's European capital city knows a lot about, the European Union stands for peace, it stands for prosperity, and it has been built on values of human dignity, on freedom and solidarity. 
And with Ukraine just 270 kilometers away from here, fighting for these values, we remember the spirit in which this College of Europe was built. It was built and established in 1992 after the fall of the Iron Curtain, when borders across the European continent opened and kinships rekindled. And this is a symbol of the, if you will, the unfinished adventure of European integration. Because with the opening of EU membership negotiations with Ukraine and with Moldova, and with the extension of the list of EU candidate member states, further EU enlargement lies ahead. So thank you for opening the satellite campus in Tirana. That's so important. It, and, and I have met so many people who come from Albania who told me thank you for doing that. It matters to them that they can see the perspective that we uh, saw before we joined the European Union. And if we see how this college uh, continues um, under your leadership uh, to attract students from all of Europe and beyond uh, in its um, uh, Master of Arts in European Interdisciplinary Studies. It's not only a place for students, it is also a place for uh, academics and professors that come together in a truly multicultural setting, uh, an experience and perspective for their future. I couldn't help also thinking about this when I saw Alex Stubb elected president of Finland on, Saturday, on Sunday evening, when I said he could give a little bit of credit to him standing up there for having been not only a College of Europe student, but also one of my professors in 2003. Uh, and, um, and so why would colleges like this uh, you know, be so important in the way we do uh, and run our democratic life, or at least trying to achieve the best that a democracy uh, can offer. Because those very values that I mentioned are very much rooted in having started here on Europe's uh, eastern flank. And also, the long-established mission at this college to prepare students to think beyond disciplinary boundaries, uh, beyond preconceptions, to encourage us as we were, to build bridges and embrace a wider perspective on Europe and the world. The mission began, in fact, three decades ago with the ambition to overcome an unnatural post-communist east-west divide. My uh, dissertation was a comparison of electoral systems of the former four Visegrad countries at the time. And uh, what I wanted to study is whether the way the four countries of so Poland, Hungary, Slovakia, and Czech Republic had uh, identified different electoral systems in the new young democratic exercises and how that would shape the political scenery of those countries. And I think it would be, you know, worth also looking at in terms of when we bring interdisciplinary studies, you know, I was a lawyer studying politics, uh, as to how we can really look at electoral systems and democratic exercises as returning um, elected officials and representatives and the roles that they play. Now, with just 115 days uh, before the European elections, taking part in that vote will be more important than ever. One would say, this is obvious, but actually it's not. In each country that I visit, there are questions, in some countries increasing questions. Also in these countries that are celebrating 20 years of membership, as to what kind of reflection we should have about these 20 years. About the successes we have had, but also about convincing citizens in those countries to go out to vote for the elections. And my message is that the 720 elected MEPs that will come to Brussels after the European elections will shape policies and adopt legislation that will affect nearly a half a billion citizens of the European Union. And we take this for granted. We forget that there are more people in this world who cannot choose their leaders than there are those who can, who can hold their representatives to account, to give them the responsibility, or at least to be able to give them the responsibility, 
but also take it away from them when they don't perform as you want, or as you wish, or as you were promised, or as they committed to. Yesterday, I, I was in the Czech Republic um, doing a similar um, trip as I did here, um, uh, also with the students, and I thought of some of the inspirational words of former Czech President Václav Havel, who once said, we live in the postmodern world where everything is possible and almost nothing is certain. And his mantra is so fitting today, and it is one that we should follow. It, it is about being masters, ultimately, of our destiny, of the importance of taking charge, because nothing is impossible, particular in these unsetting times. Now, when we go back and say, what can we do? Uh, what can you do? I would like you to think a little bit more than just voting. I would like you to think about the possibility of placing yourself out for elections, being candidates, not being afraid to lose, not giving up, and being also ambassadors of your country with the experience that you got here. And at the end of the day, in spite of all of its imperfections, the EU really still means opportunity and making people's lives a little bit better and a little bit fairer. What have we done over the past five years? The European Union has delivered in an unprecedented way. We have come together like I would never have thought. When I was elected president just over two years ago, I was asked, what will your mandate look like? And I remember thinking very clearly, you know, we are still at, it was still at the height of the pandemic. We were slowly, slowly hoping to get out of it. And me thinking, okay, we are going to talk about a very difficult uh, economic recovery post-pandemic. Who would have told me that less than a month later uh, we would have had a war on our borders, uh, on our continent? But what we learned also in the past years is that we have done all of this in solidarity. We have procured vaccines for all European citizens. We have been firm in our support to Ukraine. We are bringing, as we said, our neighbours closer to us. We are bolstering our collective security. And when we talk about all of these successes, and we should do it very openly. Someone told me today, you know, we, we need to project hope uh, because we are fighting scaremongering campaigns, misinformation, propaganda, fake news. Uh, it is always much better to build a campaign on fear than on hope. It's always better or easier, sorry, to destroy than to build. So in all my discussions, and, and when I make a point to mention Europe's successes, and we have had a few, as I've just mentioned, very big legislative packages that have been voted this week and last week, actually, that we, people have been asking, our citizens have been asking for them for years. But I think we also need to be honest about where we can do better and whether we may have gone too far, too fast. And that we understand the real frustration with some of our processes. And the wrong thing to do would be to ignore those frustrations, to think that we know better, to just talk to ourselves in an echo chamber rather than listening to real concerns of people who are not happy with what is happening, who don't feel included in the decisions that we make, who, can't, who feel they can't afford the decisions that we take and how they are implemented. So the answer has to be dialogue, it has to be discussion, and it really has to be about convincing people to vote next June. And I will focus specifically on something that was brought up in each and every uh, meeting that I had today uh, with the agriculture sector and the protests that are ongoing um, across uh, most European Union member states uh, where farmers are expressing their serious concerns. And our answer, and as a parliament we have been very clear on this, that first of all we cannot address our climate challenges without our farmers 
and our agricultural sector. That when we talk about the green transition, part and parcel of that green transition has to be because we aim to be the most climate ambitious continent on this planet. And I would say we have no choice but to be that because there is a real emergency that is sticking, but that in that transition we leave no one behind. And least of all, we do not leave the agricultural sector behind. And that's the Europe I would like to see. None of this, and I've just given a whole list and gone back and forth, has been easy. Uh, if I think about how long it took us to arrive to a vote yesterday morning in the Justice and Home Affairs Committee on a Migration Pact that we hope to conclude uh, in March or in April, that we have defied the odds of adopting unprecedented numbers of sanctions packages, that we have stepped up and have shown unity more than ever. And I see this. Uh, it's not only you know, a facade, actually. When I attend the European Council in my official position, it's really something that we can really say together that we have achieved a lot. It hasn't always been easy. We have had to do a lot of convincing to do. But in the line of this um, promotion, I hope we have made uh, Madeleine proud. So I'm convinced that uh, the future that lies ahead is with you in it, with your acumen, with your knowledge. Please use this experience uh, to select your career path, if I can say this, yes. My kids don't like it when I say this. Um, but never forget the experiences you had in order for you to take the next step. And it could be one step, two steps, three steps ahead, but always look back to what you learned here and look left and right to your friends and neighbors in your dormitories and never forget them. I never will, that's for sure. Thank you very much.
was Frederick Chopin's Waltz in C sharp minor, splendidly performed by Mr. Piotr Kaczynski. And now, allow me to give the floor to our dear Nassau Institute community, represented tonight by Noor Ben Mekhtek, General Coordinator of the Student Representatives Board. Noor? Distinguished guests and esteemed colleagues, once again, welcome in Natalin. I have to start by admitting the pleasure it is to stand on a stage reflecting women leadership, both in politics and academia. As the general coordinator for student representatives, it is both an honor and a great responsibility to stand before you here today and speak on behalf of my colleagues. Our gathering symbolizes the conversions of minds, exchange of ideas, the pursuit of shared values that define our institution and transcend European borders. We are indeed graced by the presence of the remarkable leaders of today, but as noted by Madam President's also, uh, President, also the leaders of tomorrow. At the College of Europe, we are not merely students. We are ambassadors of unity, diversity, and progress. We represent not only our individual nationalities, but also the collective aspirations of those who want to overcome the challenges and embrace opportunities together. Yesterday, many celebrated love. Today, in this outstanding gathering, we want to celebrate unity, but most importantly, peace. As students, we want to walk into classrooms knowing that each one of us can go back home in July and feel unthreatened. The European integration is a project that was built on the idea of peace. Today, more than ever, global peace is being challenged. As students, we are aware of the vital role we play in shaping the narratives of our time. We advocate for positive change by harnessing the power of education and collaboration. This year, Europe and the world would stand across multiple elections that probably would determine and shape the future, therefore touching all of us present here today and many generations to come. In closing, let us reaffirm our commitment to the values that define us, democracy, solidarity, and respect of human life. The latter should come above all. And let us work tirelessly to realize the promise of a more just, equitable, and peaceful world. Thank you.
in Youth is Pleasure indeed, and it was our pleasure to listen to our one and only Natlin Choir. This energizing interpretation of Gustav Holst's piece marks the end of today's ceremony. Madam President, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for being with us. Thank you.